good evening. It's good to see everybody. I love hearing people chattering before church. It means that people are alive, people are here, people are ready for church. Amen. Let's go to number 31. Number 31, everybody standing. Number 31, he lives. He lives. Amen. That's what we have missions conference about, to go tell the world he lives. Let's sing it out. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. On the second, in all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. On the last, rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives with That's right, we're in the back in America. Oh, my soul. Uh, in Africa in general, most churches that you go into, you, I, the preacher comes up and says, Hallelujah. Everybody says, Amen. amen. All right, let's try that again. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. That's good. And now, it's really good for pastors who don't have anything to say because they just say, Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Wasn't that a great message? <laughs> amen. And it is such a blessing to be here. Uh, Pastor has been so very, very good to us, um, just being a, a, a great blessing. And we had a, a great uh, lunch today, and let's see, we had some Chinese, and all right, maybe I shouldn't check the fortune cookie. But you know, seeing as it was purchased by a pastor, and it came into the house of God, maybe that sanctified it, all right? And it says, you deserve to have a good time after a hard day's work. <laughs> and all right, maybe, you know, honestly, we all we deserve is hell, but God still is such a great God, amen? And uh, Philippians 4.4 4 is still in the Bible, and the Bible still says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And it's just a, uh, we've had a great time here, I tell you that. I hope you all had a great time, and also, praise God, Pastor took us out shopping today and gave us some of your money. <laughs> and thank you for that. I know where it came from. And let me show you what I got here. Here, I got, guess, you see that there? Yeah. Woo! Say amen. amen. That's the right one. Yeah. And the left one. Yeah. You want see again? All right. Right one. Left one. Can you all see? Yeah. All right. Should we do both? Yeah. All right, let's do both. All right. Ready? Hip. You got it? All right. Y'all get that? <laughs> Amen. Y'all having fun? 
It's good to be in the house of the Lord, and laughter doeth good like a medicine. I tell you, we need a lot of laughter in this world today, amen? But uh, let's go ahead and pray, and, and we need God's spirit also, amen? And we need his joy and his, and his uh, peace and his, uh, oh, all of it, amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being so very good to us. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for just having the ability to have joy and have a good time in, in the, with fellow Christians and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. And God, I pray that you please uh, meet with us here. Lord, open up our hearts and, and just fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, we give you the honor and the glory and the praise for you are your name is above every name. You're higher than the highest and greater than the greatest. You're King of kings, Lord of lords, and Lord, we need you in our life. Lord, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was watching you all come in tonight, and all the ladies gathering back there in the back. They were gathered up here in the front and then in the back and had one common denominator. My wife was in the middle of it. But y'all are having way too much fun in church. This, this, is, this is the synagogue. This is a, the auditorium. We ought to just sit here and be quiet and meditate. That's a funeral home. That's not a church. Amen? So praise God. Amen. If you want to know how that little trick was done tonight, you see me afterwards with a $10 bill, and I'll tell you. It's always a joy to have these mission conferences. I enjoy it. I love mission conferences. I, when I was pastoring, our mission conference was the, the, the highest attended conference we had all year long. It didn't make any difference who we had any other time, whether it was Brother Hiles or whoever. Uh, the mission conference was always the best attended because it was the most enjoyable. And one of the parts that I like the most is getting to know the missionaries and uh, getting to know them better. Brother Rich Fulton has been here uh, several times for us and preached before, but we've never been able to spend a lot of time with him. And at this time, we've, we've gotten to know him a little bit. And uh, uh, he, uh, he's an amazing guy. I enjoy uh, talking with him. And, and uh, it's just an enjoy. What's most enjoyable about talking with him and Tim and, and some of these other fellows is they can't hear either. <laughs> That's what I said. It's, yeah, if, you aren't, if you aren't sure what I'm talking about, wait a few years, and you'll, you'll pick it up. Amen. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all, some of us, like Tim, have hearing aids. Some of us, like Brother Fulton and I, go, huh? Huh? But uh, it's been a joy to get to know him. Brother Fulton spent 17 years, he and his wife, in, in the country of Ireland as missionaries. I've been to Ireland. I've worked over there. I've, I've had people saved in Ireland, but it, it's not easy. Uh, Ireland is a difficult place. It's a, it's a Roman Catholic country. And uh, one of the things that I found out, though, is as you go through the, the, uh, the, the countryside and you knock on doors and talk to people, they're, they're uh, disillusioned with the Catholic Church. They're wondering what's going on with all these priests and all this immorality that's going on. They should have asked me. I grew up in a Catholic neighborhood. We had two Catholic churches in my neighborhood, and it was known from the time I was a young lad that these priests were fooling around with the nuns in the nunnery. That's, that was just common knowledge. Uh, they, they, in those days, they, the Mass was in Latin. Why was it in Latin? Because they didn't want you to know what they were saying. And they always said to their people, no, you can't read the Bible. Don't you read the Bible. Don't you do what them Protestants say. You, don't, you can't understand it. You're going to mess yourself up. Let us interpret it for you. And uh, that, you know, that's from the pit of hell. But, but today, today, they're questioning what's going on, what's happening in our church, and what's happening to our church. And uh, so you can win people to Christ. They were over there for 17 years serving God. Once again, that's faithfulness. Amen? I, I love people that are faithful to stick by something. Uh, Brother Greg and I were talking last night going home about, about uh, uh, being faithful. And, and uh, I told him about a, a conference I was in that they had a little panel discussion with the missionaries. <clears throat> and I was one of those missionaries who was in it. One of the questions they asked is <clears throat> when you get discouraged, you get defeated, you feel like you're quitting, what do you do to get yourself out of it? And they went around and they came to me finally. And I said, well, unfortunately, I'm going to sort of burst your bubble. I said, I have never, ever one time felt like quitting the ministry. I've never felt discouraged in the ministry. Um, I've been disillusioned by some things, but I never felt like quitting. And that wasn't hard for me to answer, but then they asked me another question, why? I had to think about that for a few minutes. And I said, the answer to that is real simple. It's cost me too much to get to where I am. I'm not about to go back. And it's cost me a church. It's cost me friends. It's cost me a lot of things over the years. 
cost me money. It's cost me so much. And, and I wanted to invest in something that was real and solid, and I'm not about to give it up and, and lose. I'm going to stick with it to the end. Amen? And we ought to stick with what we're doing to the end. Now, we can't always do the same thing. I'm not pastoring today um, just because I'm older, and I think a younger man can do a better job of, of the work of God in the church. But I, I, I'm still serving God. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm, working, I'm looking forward to doing more. I'm looking forward to doing more. Well, that's exactly what Brother Fulton did. I know, I know people I can name for you a missionary right now that was going to the country of Albania. This has been back in 1992 or three, going to Albania. <clears throat> before he got there, he raised almost all his support. Before he got there, the country of Albania closed. There was a revolution. And uh, so you know what he did? Packed up his bags and belongings and just stayed here. If God calls you to be a missionary, you ought to go somewhere, amen? There's other countries near Albania. You can go there, and, and you can work, and you can go be in and out. A million things to do. Don't quit. Just don't quit. He didn't quit. Now he's been seven years with Rock of Ages prison ministry, and they're going to parole him very soon, I think. And, but uh, it's been a joy to get to know him and, and Mrs. Fulton. We've had a, a good time talking with them. And uh, Brother Fulton's going to come now, and he's going to give us our missionary presentation for this evening. Are you going to show something first? Okay. I know I've messed up my life, but Jesus has made it right. Because of Rock of Ages, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior in my life. I have been in prostitution since I was 14 years old, and because of Rock of Ages, I have turned my life over to Jesus Christ as my Savior. It's no fun being locked up. But I'm free on the inside because Christ set me free. Um, I was saved in uh, Madison County Jail, in, uh, right on the other side of the city of St. Louis. And I picked up a track out of a trash can and uh, read it. And as a result of that, I was uh, saved. I uh, was pacing the floors in the county jail to thinking about my life. And a, a few months later, I went to the Boonville Correctional Center where I uh, would spend the remainder of my uh, sentence and time and uh, met a guy by the name of Brother Carol Schoenhaus, who was a Rock of Ages prison minister, uh, chaplain there in the prison. For nearly four decades, the Rock of Ages has been reaching prisoners uh, all over the United States and around the world, working on five different continents. The Rock of Ages Chaplaincy Program is a unique ministry offering missionaries daily contact with those incarcerated and missionary chaplain's responsibilities to his institution are compared to a pastor of a local New Testament church. Our goal is to, to reach these guys once again. Now we know that's number one. But number two, we want to see the end of the, uh, the aspect of the ministry that the Lord has called us to. And that is to see these guys lead others to the Lord Jesus Christ and learn how to live a productive life for him. Prison revival teams consist of missionaries, pastors, and local church volunteers holding revival meetings in prisons, jails, and juvenile detention centers. These revival meetings consist of soul winning, cell-to-cell -cell visitation, visiting in lockup units, death row units, and conducting evangelistic services. In America today, there's a disturbing increase in crime among adolescents. Ages is, is mending lives of those who are incarcerated, but not only just mending lives, but we are molding lives of our young people inside the public schools across America. There are two aspects of our school program. First is the character under construction. It consists of over 160 lessons that target specific character traits missing in many of our publishing department produces millions of tracts, booklets, and related pieces of gospel material annually. This material we produce is given to our missionaries free of charge for distribution in their ministries. On behalf of the prisons, schools, military, and each of us at Rock of Ages Publishing Department, we thank you for partnering with us and helping reach lost souls for Christ. Our lovely ladies ministry is designed to reach incarcerated women and inmates families. Many are in prison and they feel unloved and uncared for. They need someone that cares for them. And most importantly, we want to share with them how that the Lord loves them and he cares for them. I grew up, I grew up in the church, you know, I strayed away, 
made some bad choices and everything, and I'm glad to say that I got saved August 12, 2012. While many report extreme religious limitations within the ranks of the U.S. military, Rock of Ages is currently reaching all military correctional facilities in the continental USA. We provide the Servicemen's Bible Institute, which disciples thousands of uniformed service members around the world. As God saves souls and changes lives among these women, they become a positive influence on their families and those within the institutions. I like Rock of Ages, it really helps me. And um, I also got me a Rock of Ages um, Bible, which is great, and, um, and it's been a big help for me. Rock of Ages College of Biblical Studies and Seminary is a non-accredited Bible college. It is an external studies college with students working at their own pace. The Rock of Ages College of Biblical Studies is a great place to further your education. Get a basis that you might serve God to the greatest. My stepfather molested me as a child. And out of that, I got pregnant at the age of 14. I had a beautiful little girl. And uh, I was real young, so uh, my mom helped me raise her. I had a lot of people say, get, you know, have an abortion or do whatever, but I couldn't do that, so I kept my baby, my mom out. And uh, so as the years go on, at the age of 16, when my daughter was 16, she got killed. And uh, it tore me apart, I didn't know what else to do, so I took off and went out in the world and started doing drugs. And, uh, she was killed in 1999. And from 99 to 2000. <laughs> I was doing drugs. I was out robbing people. Doing a lot of things to to do to get the drugs, but uh, in 2007 they arrested me and I went to Silverdale and I uh, was sitting in the bunk one day and people kept telling me that there was this group that comes to comes and has church and it's called the Rock of Ages Ministries. So they're wonderful people. You need to come listen to them. And I shut them down. Didn't know whether to go or not, but. And I decided, yeah, something said, get up and go. So I went, <laughs> and thank God I did, because I got saved that night. <laughs> amen, amen.
Let's grab our hymn books and stand. We'll sing number five. Number five, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, the first, third, and fourth verse. Number five. you take in exchange for your soul? What would you take? That song says the whole world. Nah, it's not enough. It's not enough. So now wait a minute. If that's true of your soul, that's true of their souls. Those are precious souls. They're worth everything in the world because the blood of Christ is the most important, the most valuable thing in this world, we ought to go after them. Prison ministry and the uh, jail ministry is close to my heart. I was, I don't know how many years, 10 years, 12 years, I was the chaplain for the Lenaway Sheriff's Department and the Lenaway um, and Adrian Police Department. And I had the privilege of preaching in jail many times. And one of the greatest joys of my life, Brother Rich, is one of our, two of our converts got married. That there was a boy, a man, and a woman, and uh, they got married, and they went to Ireland as missionaries. Now they're not there now, but they're serving. They're worked with. Uh, um, what what are they with? They're very precious seed. Wings wings is. I don't know what it's called. Something wings is something or other. It's not wings as eagles, but it's a Bible printing and distribution ministry, and along with bearing precious seed. But uh, what a joy! To see them coming and growing. They say, where are all the converts? They're all, they're all over. I don't know where they are. God knows where they are. It's not my job to keep up with them. But thank God I found two of them. Amen? Yeah. So, all right. I want to welcome you here tonight. We're glad that you came. And uh, this is our uh, Harvest Baptist Church 2020 Mission Conference. And uh, I'm thrilled that you're able to be here. We have, do you, Bruce, you have the cards? We want to pass out the Faith Promise Commitment cards. Everybody get one tonight. And uh, they haven't been passed out to this point, have they? Anybody have one? You got one? You stole it then. <laughs> uh, I want you to get one. You've seen these before. These are not anything that's unusual. But uh, we want to take up a commitment. And I don't know about you, but I always want to do more for God this year than I did the year before. And uh, I don't know what God wants you to do. I don't, if you came up to me, right, if you come up to me after the service, say, Brother Cox, what, what should I do in missions? You know what I'm going to tell you? I haven't got the slightest idea. Go to God. Go to God. You know, there's some things that you can ask me about. Mike uh, Merkley, where'd he go? He's out there. Okay. He came up to ask me a, a Bible question tonight. And uh, I said, well, I said, I, I've got two answers for you. Answer number one, if I were you, I'd say go talk to your pastor. 
there's some questions that I have opinions on, but I'm not the pastor, and I think it's the pastor's place because my opinion may be different than his. And he's a pastor of the church. I'm not. And so you say, go talk to your pastor. I said, number two, tell them, get your Bible. Here's the passages you need to look at. Get on your knees and ask God to tell you what to do. There's some things that God's just going to have to tell you because there's, there's questions. And I'm going to give you my opinion, my thought of what it is, but why don't you get on your knees before God? He'll tell you what he thinks. Amen? The reason we don't do that is we really don't want to know what God thinks. We want him to think what we think. But uh, take these home, pray over them, and then bring them back tomorrow evening. We're going to receive our faith promise commitments for the coming year. Let me tie that in with something else. Our guest speaker tonight uh, is Brother uh, uh, Ken Cermak, and it's a joy to have him here tonight. I've gotten to know him a little bit, and uh, I, uh, I work with mission. I've been working with missionaries for way too long, 30, 40 years now. And uh, you get to know them. And uh, it doesn't take me too many questions before I figure out what a guy's like. And Brother Cermak is a good man. I think he's going to do a good job. Uh, the best thing he ever did was marry his wife, and she's a good lady, amen? And so that speaks just well of him. Uh, in fact, he's got all these youngins. That speaks well of him. But uh, he's going to Papua New Guinea. That's not an easy place to be. It's not an easy place for to raise a family, not an easy place for a wife. And I'm so thrilled that his wife has been there. She knows what she's getting into. She loves the place. And, and that's a great step forward. That shows his wisdom, uh, that he's got a wife that, that wants to be there, and he's concerned about that because uh, it's a difficult place. If he's got the right kind of a wife, she's going to say, yes, honey, I'll follow you anywhere. But once she gets to where anywhere is, she might change her mind. And she's already been to anywhere. But uh, I, I'm thrilled to that. I'm thrilled about the fact that he's pastored a church. That speaks well of him. Uh, if you pastor a church and you don't want to just take vacation and move to Florida, uh, you want to keep on in the ministry, uh, that tells me he's going to do something for God. Um, I, I, I can't tell this church what to do, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what to do. Take him on this year. So what's that going to take to take him on? You know exactly what's going to take to take him on? Oh, it's going to take a lot of money. What do we, what do we pay the missionaries? Uh, what, what do we give them? Brian, Brian what, what? 70? Huh? 50 a month. Okay, 50 a month. So you know what that's going to take? That's going to take five people. What do you mean five people? Five people willing to give $2.50 a week. You can't eat at McDonald's for that. $2.50 a week. Five people say, look, I'll, I'll give up $2.50 a week so that I, I, we can send a missionary, we can take that missionary on for support. That, you, that isn't a big jump, is it? I mean, good night. We ought to have enough faith to increase our faith promise giving by $2.50 a week, $10 a month. But I think we could do more than that if we really wanted to trust the Lord and see what he'd do through us. Take that little sheet home and pray. Say, Lord, what do you want to do through me this year? What do you want to... Folks, we're getting awful close. You know, I said last night, I'll tell you when to quit when you see him face to face. Till that time, keep on. Don't quit. Don't quit. You might get beat up a lot. You might have scars on your back, but don't quit. Just keep on. I got news for you. We're not very far from that time when we're going to see him face to face. If we're going to do something for God, we're going to show him how much we love him, we've got to do it down here. There's no way to show God how much you love him in heaven. There's no sacrifice you can make in heaven. The way to show love is by sacrifice. Why don't you, why don't you see what he'll do through you? Say, Lord, we're getting awful close. I don't know how much time we've got left. I don't think it's much. I want to do something. I want to do something more. I, don't, I, want, to, I want to leave this life doing something great for you, something more than I've done before. Lord, what will you do through me? I don't know how I can do anymore. I, I, I'm limited, but you're not. Lord, show me what you want to do and put that down on here. Brother Cermak, you come, Ken, and you preach to us. Amen? You can go ahead and come up. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray, and I'll let the rest of you come, family come up. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to hear Brother Cermak preach. I pray, Lord, that you please Fill them with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you please move on our hearts. Holy Spirit, we want you to feel welcome. Lord, I'm, I'm envisioning, Lord, some of our young people that are sitting here. I pray that you please tug at their heart. Help them to, to see themselves as a difference maker in some foreign field. 
Lord, I ask that you please move on our hearts, Lord, as, as the givers. Help us to be challenged. Lord, help us to vote with our money. We want more soul saved this year than last year. Speak to us. Give us the special. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Good evening to you. I'm going to confess that I made an error this morning. I uh, sent your pastor a text and asked him what time to be done. So now if I go over, now I'm just being a rebel. So um, uh, now I've got a sermon that takes an hour and I don't have an hour. So uh, we'll blame it on the Holy Ghost. Amen? All right. <laughs> no, we won't. Mark chapter 10 is where we're going to go. We sure do appreciate you allowing us to be with you for this meeting. We were supposed to be here back in March, uh, and I'm, I'm imagining the weather probably wasn't much better then, uh, but um, we're from, our, we may not be originally from the South, but we, we call that home, and our blood is thin for that reason. So um, bear with us as we suffer through your Arctic winters this week. And if you, uh, so everybody, well, you don't know, you ought to come back in December. No, we're not, we're not going to do, we know about that too. Uh, but let's, let's go to Mark 10. I, I want to, I want to, um, we're not going to do a whole lot of turning. Um, I am a, I do appreciate his, his compliments there. It, it probably shows more about the fact he doesn't know me than he does. Uh, but uh, we, 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 uh, let, let me just, let me say it like this. I, I was raised in church. I, I went to church nine months before I was born. Independent Baptist, fundamental, King James, all the adjectives how to define how great we are. I was one of those. I didn't get saved until I was 15. Uh, but but if you've been saved any length of time, and, and I'm not directing this towards anybody individually, but you, we we have a. I've heard my fair share of bad preaching. And I remember as a young man, I prayed to the Lord, Lord, let me never be one of those men. Now He has allowed me to be one of those men at times, to show me. It's me that's got to do this, not you. Uh, but that being said, I think one of the keys to, to having good Bible preaching is the word Bible. 
and uh, I've heard, uh, especially downtown, you hear half a verse read and then a bunch of running and screaming, and running and screaming's good if it's for the right reason, but, you know, I've, I've, I've just heard a whole lot of stuff. And so, uh, tonight, I want to be very aware and cognizant of the idea that we hold in our laps the perfect, preserved Word of God that doesn't need correction, and you didn't come tonight to hear my opinion, you came to hear the Bible, and so uh, let, let's, let's learn some things from the Bible tonight, amen? All right, Mark chapter 10. Uh, the Bible says, we're going to start in verse 17, even though uh, verse 1 through 16 could be a great point to the first point, but we, we just won't do that. We're, maybe we'll reference it later. But we're going to start reading verse 17, and we're going to, in our time, we're going to try to get to the end of the chapter. Uh, and and, and here's, here's what I want to accomplish. In, in the Gospels, yea, even through the New Testament, Jesus Christ uh, lays out for us a command. To follow him that's really the essence of Christianity it's just him leading him being the captain him being the shepherd and us following him not you trying to figure out which way to lead you figuring out how to submit and follow and if you're saved you're familiar with how to humble yourself because that's what you had to do to get saved our problem is we can't remember how to do that again and that's humble ourselves we'll get into that in just a little bit but, it, but our, our, our verse is not in Mark 8, but Mark 8 kind of sums up what I'm telling you. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, it says, And when he called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said, said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. And so tonight is not a sermon on the need to follow Christ, whether it be uh, following him to a mission field physically, or following him in the great advice you got on taking us on. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but but following the Lord is not without opposition. Okay, uh, the Bible says there in Book of Peter we have an enemy, and that Bible says he is our adversary, and he's compared not to a a little bee or a wasp. He's compared to a roaring lion who walked about seeking whom he may devour. And uh, if you read the Book of Job, the people that he has in his appetite are those that fear God and eschew evil and are perfect and want to follow the Lord. And if you're trying to follow the Lord, you get on his you get on his dinner menu. And there are things that he will give us to hinder us from following the Lord like we're supposed to. And you say, well, what could those things be? They could be a, a plethora of things. But as I examine my own life, I think of some things that have hindered me, that do hinder me from following the Lord like I should. And Mark chapter 10 kind of lays out a real nice summary of that. And so one may hit you. All of them may hit you. None of them may hit you, but we'll, we'll see if we can do something tonight. Amen? Tonight we're just going to talk about some things that will hinder you from following the Lord like you're supposed to. All right, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. The Bible says, and when he had gone forth, this is the Lord, when he had gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That, I mean, that's good stuff. That's a good approach to the Lord. Hey, Lord. Uh, he doesn't just say, hey, buddy, hey, Bubba. Hey. He says, good master. He, humility. He kneels down. What can I, he's seeking eternal life. He's doing better than a lot of people Jesus ran into. Look what he says. Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that's Jesus denying his deity. It's not. It's Jesus Christ giving this man an opportunity to recognize. That's what he's doing. He, here's God manifest in the flesh saying, let me ask you a question. Why are you calling me good? There's only one good, and he's God. And that man's supposed to respond, yes, God. <laughs> See what he did? The Lord, man, he gave him opportunity. But anyway, keep going. The Bible says, verse 19, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. That's pretty good. Jesus said, look, you, you know the law. You know God's standard for righteousness. Here's the man's response. He doesn't respond like the Luke 15 uh, Pharisee. He responds in sincerity, and I'll show you why I believe that. Look what he says in verse 20. He answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. You know what you learned from that statement? That man, having observed in his own righteousness, still knew something was missing. He's looking to the Lord for eternal life. The Lord says, well, here's, here's God's standard. He goes, I've done that, though, and there's still something missing. Now watch this, verse, verse 21. 
Here's how you know he's not self-righteous, as we've heard people say. Look what he says, verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. You don't ever hear Jesus talk that way about Pharisees who have responded that way. When the Pharisees came up and started arguing about washing hands or start talking about righteousness and start talking about how Jesus' disciples didn't match their standards or, or remember in Luke 15, I think they are not as these other, as other men are as this publican. When they had that attitude, Jesus, man, he ripped them. I mean, he got on to them. He'd preach to them. He'd call them all sorts of names. He was so unpolitically correct. <laughs> but Jesus responds to this man who's standing there saying, Lord, I, I've done all that. And Jesus looks at him and says, with love. There's love, there's compassion. He said unto him, one thing thou lackest. Now, I, before we read on, I ask you a question. Could the Lord look at your life and say, you only lack in one thing? Probably not. You, you say, I don't know you, you don't know me. But I know me. <laughs> and I know us to know that if the Lord was to come into our lives right now, even as saved individuals, we said, Lord, what do we lack? He'd probably have a list longer than one thing. Is that fair? One person lacks that. Don't they? One thing thou lackest. Here's what he's going to tell him. Go thy way. Remember those three words. We're going to reference them later on. He says, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor. Or the sermites. Don't even give. And, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come take up the cross and look at these words. Follow me. Now, the prosperity preachers and, and all those folks, here, here's how they preach it. They preach. The reason that guy didn't get saved, the reason we're going to see in a minute he walks away sorrowful is because he wouldn't bring his money and help Joel Osteen buy a new house. I mean, come on. They shouldn't name names. This is going to get rough. He did, Jesus didn't say, give it to me. Now, now listen, listen. I, we, if you want to get confused on what that passage means, read a commentary. And I, I got a pile of commentaries. You want to know eight different reasons on why that guy walked away lost? Read six different commentaries. But here's what I'm telling you. I think it's very simple. That man walked up to Jesus, sincere in the fact that he wanted eternal life, and Jesus pointed out one thing, and it had nothing to do with his wallet, it had to do with his heart. And Jesus Christ looks at that man and says, you're lacking one thing. I've got your obedience. Your parents got their respect. I've got, you the, I've got your body. You're acting right. But, but I don't have your heart. And that man, look what it says there. He was sad at that saying, verse 22, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. What a, what a passage of scripture. The, the, this, you know, the other passages tells you he's, we learn he's rich here. Other ones tell you he's young. Other places tell you he's a ruler, so we call him rich young ruler. This man, this man comes to Jesus Christ seeking for eternal life. Jesus Christ looks at him and he says, you're lacking one thing. And Jesus Christ looked at him and said, all I want is your heart. I want that affection, that, that the affection that you've directed towards your, we'll just say, your stuff, your possessions, I want that affection. And that young man weighed that decision. That young man looked and he said, my stuff or eternal life, my stuff or the Savior, my stuff or the good master, and he went with his stuff. Number one, the hindrance that will hinder you and me is your love for the temple. Your love for the temple. This young man, look what it says in verse 22. He was what at that saying? What does it say? He was sad. That man said, look, can you imagine walking away from the Savior knowing the only thing you lacked was this one thing he mentioned to you and saying, I'll take the riches, I'll take the money, I'll take the possessions, and walking away, and he didn't walk away with joy. Walked away sad. I just imagine that if he had maybe done what the Lord said, he might have walked away with some joy when he followed after Jesus. But he chose the temple. You want to see the most miserable people. This isn't a, a, a pull for your money, but you know the most miserable people is people that God has blessed physically who take that and hoard that thing and are not a blessing to others. And that's not a push to be the next missionary taken on, but you, I mean, if you want to put two and two together, you can. But here's what, here's what I'm telling you. We, we fall in love with our stuff we fall in love with the blessings, brethren, more than we do the blessings. And God's been good to us. And I tell you, this country is, is a great country. People are not swimming the waters to go to Cuba. But at the same time, if this country is not careful, we have fallen in love with the material things God has given us instead of the God that gave us those things. 
And listen, I'll tell you what, you might have worked hard, and you might have your retirement, and you might be living off the things, well, preacher, I worked hard, and I deserve, maybe. But doesn't God deserve all of it? I'll tell you what, I was, I was, I'm going to try to be mindful of time, so I'm going to say that, doesn't mean I'm going to speak today. I'm just going to be mindful that I don't have to say it, so watch this. I was, uh, uh, Lord blessed us. I was, when I was a pastor, I was a bivocational pastor. People call it a part-time pastor. States government for the, you know, uh, the United States Navy doing construction projects is what I, I wasn't in the Navy because I couldn't pass the PT test. <laughs> no, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, but, but we did construction projects in the United States Navy and the military, the government in general, get paid in money. And then one of the reasons they get paid in money is my salary. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, well, I, the Lord had blessed us. We were, we were doing work. Now watch this. Watch this. I would go to that job, I'd get up, I had to drive an hour to get my job in a truck that ran well. Some said, this one looks like a regular truck. Some said, not a regular truck. But I had, I had an F-250, 1999, it was old, but it was nice. And, and I'd get in that truck, and I'd drive myself to work, I'd get to work, and I would work with people like you folks. Isn't that about right, Ethan? <laughs> I, was, I was the only guy at work who did anything. I was the only guy at work who had a brain. I was the only guy at work who knew how to. You worked there, right? And I would come home and tell every, I'd tell my wife all that. I didn't even try. Then I'd come inside and I'd sit in the house and I'd look around and say, I think it's just time. It's like fall. Let's go dump the stuff. Let's go fly. Let's go travel. We need something new. We need something nice. I just want to do store stuff. I just want to do something. I just want to go to work. Ford, Chevy trucks, and I go, man, I, let's buy me. All I got is junk. All I got junk. <laughs> then the Lord, we went, as you heard last night, Lord, make some sloppy jeans and make some shirts. Came back, Lord said, hey, I, I began to pray. Lord, would you allow my heart to be pure and good by you? And he said, no, I like to do this stuff. Let's get this thing right. So we began to, we began to make preparations. I'll tell you what, you know, you know the first thing that come to my mind? Quit my job. What? I love my job. You were complaining yesterday. <laughs> Lord, I'm gonna have to get up. I'm gonna have to sell my house. And I've got vacation. You know, Jim and uh, Tammy are gonna have to get another truck. So I'm gonna have to sleep in all the horse stories out there. I'm gonna sleep in tents and some coaches. I don't. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Let's give up my house. He was complaining about the house. <laughs> Lord, I'm gonna have to sell this truck and go to the mission field, honey. This is my truck. I love this truck. It's got my invention in the seat. I like this truck. You know, you know what that shows us? Things are only valuable when we've got to give them up for God. They're not valuable when we give them up for us. The Lord says, I want you to give this up. And we go, I can't for, for you. And somebody else, some silly thing comes along and says, why don't you give this up for a 12% loan and a, and a payment for the next six years? I'll do it. Why don't you trade it into us for nothing? Right? And then with the dealerships, you say, so how do you know? My dad's in sales. This truck, you put your vehicle in it, I'll make the payment in there. They give you nothing. Yeah. And you sign up and sign the paper and pay five, six, seven, I don't know, eight, we paid thousand dollars a month for a nice new truck. And you didn't get nothing for the old one. And you tell the Lord, listen, I'll give this thing up and go serve you on a foreign field. And he'll give you a whole lot more than what they're turning in at the dealership rewards and glory. Here's, here, here's, here's what I'm telling you. Your love for the temporal will hinder you for, loving, for following Jesus Christ. Your love for the temporal. Look what he says down in verse, uh, verse 23. We've got to move through this. Jesus looked, down around, uh, looked around about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? This is a problem. And we live in the richest country on the world. Currently. And Jesus says, you, he looks at his disciples. Everything is a life lesson. Jesus looks at those disciples and he says, boys, it's hard for folks like you. And poor fishermen are looking going, I don't get it. Why can't he do it? And Jesus goes, listen, guys, it's hard. Because those riches and those blessings and those possessions, they not only make your life comfortable, they get your heart. 
I said, you want to make your, your church healthy? Take the blessings that God gives you and pour them back out to God. I have a pastor friend of mine in Tennessee. He had a man in his church making $50,000, making a little plumbing company. He was giving as much as he could to faith prominence, the church, trying to keep his family afloat, and doing all those things. Lord blessed his business, got multiple trucks, multiple plumbers, started making half a million a year. Miserable. He came to his pastor. He said, Pastor, I was free. I was so much happier, so much more excited about the things of God when I was making 50 grand a year instead of 450 or, or, or 500,000. The pastor looked at him and goes, I know what to do. He goes, well, what would I do? He goes, give 450000 to missions. Yeah. You know what that man said? He goes, I could never do that. He goes, you either give it or God will take it. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to be that guy. I'm telling you, when God blesses, why do we fall in love with the blessings and lose our affection for the one who gave it to us? That's my question. We've got to move. We've got to move. Look what he says down here, verse 24. The disciples were astonished at his words. <laughs> But Jesus answered again and saith unto him, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Preacher, I tell you, the stock market's going down. I tell you, the country's going down. My 401k counts on the stock market. How hardly those that trust in riches. Where's our faith? It's in Jesus Christ. Amen? Or ought to be. All right, quickly. 25. It is, hard, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Now, what that means is a camel with two humps and a little needle. You say, well, I don't think that's what it, that's what it says. <laughs> camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. They are astonished out of, all, out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? <laughs> um, fishermen. <laughs> Carpenters. Tax collectors. That's who can be saved. Well, if we just, we could do more for missions if we just had a big, if we had big givers, big givers. No, we need carpenters. We need fishermen. Well, I don't know. I don't know what you guys need. But, but blue-collared workers, that's what we need. Okay, moving on. Verse 27, Jesus looking onto them said, with God is it impossible, but not with, or with men it is impossible, I'm sorry, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Now here's Peter, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Verse 28, then Peter began to say unto him, lo, <laughs> lo, listen to me. My turn to talk now. You ever, you ever, sometimes, my, my mom used to tell me this all the time, she'd say, it's not time to talk, it's time to listen. I didn't learn that lesson, but she always said it. <laughs> time, not time to talk, it's time to listen. Now watch this. This was a time to listen. This was a time to think. This was a time to meditate. And Peter's pipes up. Peter says, lo, we have left all and followed thee. There's that following again. Peter sat standing over there as the rich young ruler's going by. Jesus' heart is broken. He's looking at those disciples saying, look, look boys, those guys are going to break your heart. And it's a sober time. It's a, it's a somber time. Jesus is broken. He says he, he loved him. He had compassion. Do you understand? Peter looks over and says, hey. You know what Peter left? A failing fishing business. <laughs> Read the New Testament. The only time he ever catches a fish is when Jesus, the carpenter, tells him to. Hey, hey Jesus, do we pay taxes? Yeah. We're, we're not part of that YouTube crowd. We're, we're going to pay taxes. Okay, well, where are we going to get that money? Why don't you go catch a fish, Peter? Oh, boy. We're never going to get any money. <laughs> go catch one fish. In his mouth will be a piece of coin. Oh, really? <laughs> G Peter's out there laboring all night, all night, all night. Comes in. The Lord says, hey, let, let's catch some fish. Oh, Lord, there's no fish out there. We can't do it. Just a thought, Peter. Just a thought. Maybe we throw the net on the other side of the boat. <sighs> what do you know? Whoa, our nets are breaking. <laughs> Just telling you, that Peter wasn't very good at his job. When Jesus finds him, he didn't even got money for new, new nets. He's fixing the ones he's got. The Lord shows up, says, uh, hey, why don't you follow me? And he goes, sure, I'll lead them. Now, let's be honest for a minute. Let's be honest for a minute. That's not true, verse 28. Even if what he left was the business, in the book of Acts, or, or later on, later on in the Gospels of the book of Acts, you find out Peter's got a wife. You know how you know he's got a wife? Because he had a mother-in-law. 
That's how that works. You don't take the mother-in-law without the wife. That'd be a bum deal. But, you, but he's got a mother-in-law. And you know where they healed the mother-in-law? In Peter's house. Here's a man looking and saying, I've left all to follow you with a wife and a family and a house and a business that he goes back to after the Lord's crucified. He didn't give up his business. He put it on hold. Now, I'm not beating Peter up. I'm telling you, giving up all for the Lord has a different definition to us than it does to him. Lord, I've given up everything for you. And the Lord goes, oh, no, no, we haven't even started. Lord, I've two bricks of wood for this guy. He already said he's going to go over. I know, I know. The Lord goes, I, I want more than two fifty. I want it all. Because I gave it all to you. All right, all right, moving through. Jesus, verse 29, Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man, isn't this interesting, that hath left house, but you've still got one of those. Brethren, his brother standing right there in the group, Sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, he's got one of those, or lands, that's where houses sit, for my sake and the gospels. Now watch this promise, this is a blessing. But he shall receive a hundredfold at this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, with land, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Here's what the Lord promised him. He said, Peter, listen, there's nobody that's going to give up all this thing. give up the temporal blessings, you'll get temporal blessings back and eternal blessings. It's like an interest rate. Yeah. Brother, I'll tell you what, what have we really given up? What have we really given up? I'll tell you what, we, even as missionaries, we're, we're headed to a mission field. It's been said that's a hard country. It is, but at the end of the day, going there to serve my Savior, what am I really giving up? What am I really giving up? And all you can think of is temporary luxuries. Because, brethren, that's all it is. Our Savior is worthy for us to take a pass on the temporal to invest in the internal. Amen? Yeah. Now, when, they, when he quoted verse 30, we're going to get to point number two, the disciples didn't hear that wonderful promise. They're like you and me. They don't hear what's being said. They hear parts of it. They didn't hear the part about you get the hundredfold and all that. Here's what they heard. Read the verse again, verse 30. But he shall receive a hundredfold now at this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. What's the next two words? That's all they heard. That's all they heard. Because that's all you would have heard. We're waiting for the catch. Jesus says, listen, guys, you give up the temporal for me. I'm going to bless you now, and I'm going to bless you hereafter. And right now you'll have to suffer a little. What? <laughs> Stop. Wait a minute. Rewind. Per persecution? <laughs> no. Look what he says. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And they were going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they, and they were amazed as they, look what it says, they followed. The theme of it is things that hinder from following. These men are following the Lord. They're following the Lord in a physical sense, but get what we're saying. They're following the Lord as they head to Jerusalem, and the word there says they were amazed. Number two, something that'll, that'll keep you from following the Lord, that'll hinder you, is your fear of suffering, your fear of future potential suffering. You've got a Bible promise. You ready? Two Bible promises. The first one we don't like. 
Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise. Promise number two, I shall never leave thee nor forsake thee. The promise isn't that he keeps you from it. The problem is, the promise is I've got someone to get through it with. And that's not just my wife, that's Jesus Christ. Now watch this, look at this. Verse 32, as they were going up to Jerusalem, Jesus went before them, they were amazed. As they followed, they were afraid. <laughs> and he took again the 12 and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. Now, the Lord is, is, is so wise. He gives counsel, comfort different than we would, right? So imagine if I had walked into this missions conference and I began to confide in you and confide in your pastor and I began to say, listen, guys, I'm, I'm just so scared. I've got a wife and I've got a brand new baby. We're going to a place where, to, where COVID isn't even a scare because of how bad the diseases are. I'm, I, I, it's tribal violence and, and fill in all the trouble. Oh, I, I'm, I'm scared of this. tendency to downplay not the lord's look what the lord said they're they're all worried and he hears this he knows this and he begins to tell them something verse 33 saying behold we go up to jerusalem and the son of man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the gentiles and they shall mock him and shall scourge him shall spit upon him and shall kill him and the third day he shall rise again now they didn't hear that third day rise again Here's what they heard. They're going, Brethren, we're not promised an easy road down here. You've got no New Testament promise that says God's going to keep you out of a jail cell. You've got no New Testament promise that God's going to keep you out of poverty. You've got no New Testament promise that God is going to keep you physically in good health. God gave you a promise that no matter how bad it gets, no matter if they kill you and eat you, he's coming back and he's going to get you out of this mess. Like Job said, those, the, the worms destroy this body. Yet in my flesh I see God. Brother, we got a promise. Our promise is they're gonna, they're gonna, brother was giving testimony, they're gonna do us wrong. They're gonna persecute the God. We're just the, the physical vessel that they observe to persecute the God they hate. And our Savior said, <laughs> our Savior said, they're gonna do that to me, they're gonna do it to you, and just rest assured, one day we'll spend eternity together ruling. God, I don't want to suffer, but we don't get to reign if we don't suffer. Look what it says. We won't turn to it, but 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this way. A man who spent a lot of time in jail, Paul the Apostle, who was beat a bunch, endured such contradiction of sinners, as the Bible said about Jesus, but endured it himself. Paul did. He said, for our light affliction, which is, watch this, but for a moment, worketh in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. My family's not excited that grandkids are leaving the country. My family's not excited that a three-week-old who, or what should be a couple months old when she leaves, is going to leave for years and they're not going to see her grow up in her infancy, the first girl in the family. They're not excited that we're moving to a place where people die of all sorts of things. But brethren, we're not excited to leave them behind either. But my, my parents, I, when, we were first, when we first started, my parents, especially my wife's mother, who's not, not a believer, but my parents are, they'll get together and they'll say, what, what happens if this bad thing happens? And initially, I'd begin to tell them, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. You know what I tell them now? It probably is. What if you get malaria? We probably will. 
You say, you're such a cynical person. I'm telling you, I've got no promise that I won't. I've got a promise of a God who watches for those that love him. And listen, listen, this is a hard truth, and I don't have it down, but I understand the concept. I wish I had it in my heart. If God can get more glory through my suffering than I want it, but I don't have that in my heart. I got that in my mind. If me getting malaria and suffering can give him more glory, then God get me through that suffering because let's do it. You say, it's easy to say, it's harder to do. I'm not denying that fact, but is he not worthy? Amen. He's worthy. Absolutely. All right, I got to move. You know what God promised you in Psalms 30? He said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Yeah. Brethren, this thing's temporary. This thing's temporary. You know what hinders me, though? What if we got to suffer? What if we got to suffer? I've got a, uh, I've got a friend of mine. I'm, I'm mindful of time. Please, please bear with me. I've got, a, I've got a friend of mine in Papua New Guinea. He's one of our Bible Institute students that's going to wait for us. He's a man named Mapua. Mapua got saved. I don't always say story. It's just how it goes. Mapua got saved reading a gospel tract. We have no idea who gave him that gospel tract. He doesn't know. He's just walking down the street in that house one day. And he got a gospel tract and read it. And from being from a charismatic background, he read that gospel tract and said, Oh, this man got it. Turn it off and never turn it back. Sat down in the church and asked the Lord to save him. Didn't get no. Nobody knows. busy and, and he starts he starts preaching well that doesn't go well with the mother-in-law <laughs> the mother-in-law is the charismatic pastor in town and her deacon is the mayor it's a good story <laughs> she goes to the mayor and says he's got to stop he's got to stop now throw him in jail And he spent and 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 uh, he spent he spent three days in jail. Now, when you think of jail, please don't picture the pictures you've seen on this video. A third world country jail. We preached in the jail when we were there. Is the best thing I can compare it to would be like a like a petting zoo, really. You walked in there, and there's a central thing. They let the guys come out. They give them a bag of ice and a pot, and they get to cook their food. And they get to come out for one hour a day. They have a 12 by 12 cell with a hole in the corner. And, uh, and they have a water hose that they get to share. They take it every hour and put it in one cell. And then that just wants clothes, drink water, and food. And they put 12, or 10 to 12 men in a 12 by 12 cell. They got the return room is probably the way that. Now, I'm not, I'm not glorifying that. I'm telling you, that's what a man that's in jail for three weeks is getting there. You didn't sign up for that. And he's sitting there for two days. came back 
They got him out. His wife cleared up those charges. He went back to town. I met him. He's one of the guys waiting on us to start Bible school. You know what happened recently after that? I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm telling you this part, but it's, it's good stuff. You know what he said? He said uh, his father died and his grandfather died, both unsaved, unfortunately. But they both died within a couple months of that and left him a huge piece of land in that town. That man says he's got a burden to go plant a church in that town. He's waiting for us to get there and be helpful. Here, here's what I'm telling you. That man's endured some suffering, went through some suffering, three weeks saved, and said, he's worthy if I got to do more. I asked him, I said, my poor, what if you go to jail again? He goes, been there, done that. It'll be okay. I said, what if it's longer? He said, maybe we'll get more folks saved. You know what that is? That's a man who understood what his Savior did for him and said, the suffering's worth it. But brethren, God may not ask you to suffer. He's just asked you to be willing to suffer. Is he not worthy? I think it's a pretty selfish mindset we've got that, he's, that it's, a, it's acceptable for us that he can suffer for us on that cross, but it's not okay for us to suffer for him. You say, what do you know about suffering? Just what the Bible says. Please don't look at me as the expert. I'm just telling you, I've got a Savior who's worthy if he calls upon me to do it. Amen? And then you pray for us that he can do it. All right, we've got to move. We've got to move. I'm already over time, but, but it's okay, I think. All right, uh, <laughs> we'll find out later. The Bible says this, uh, verse 20, 35. James and John, my other two favorite members of the disciples. Now, here's why. I'm going to tell you this, and it's, I'll take this time to do it. Everybody's got their theory. I don't know if you went to Bible school, you went to Bible college, everybody's got their theory about James, John, and Jesus, Peter, James, and John, right? You go to Bible school, it's what we learn in Bible school. We learn that Jesus kind of had this, his ministry kind of looked like circles or circles within it, right? You had, you had the 70, then you had the 12, and then you had what is called that inner circle. I think those three were, and I'm going to say this, even if this is my kids, I'm going to say this. Everyone either just got here. You all have that one kid. And when you go to church, and you go to family town, and you get born, you tell that one kid to tell all the other kids. Right? And, and the reason all the other kids look at you and go, who, who is this kid sitting next to Dad? He's so great. He's the greatest kid looking. I think you say, didn't they get to go to the garden when he prayed? At the most somber, sober hour of the Lord's ministry, he looks at the at the eleven at that point and says, You three come with me. Yeah. I can't come back and have a fight. I can't have you arguing with each other. I need you to just you say they were praying with they were sleeping. Yeah. You say, why do you beat them up? Because they're us. <laughs> yeah. Peter, Peter, at the Mount of Transfiguration, you, he had spiritual insight. They see Elijah, they see Moses, they see the Lord all transfigured in his glory. And, they, and Peter gets done and he walks up to the Lord after he's done. He goes, it was good that we were here. <laughs> Let's go three times. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. The Lord goes, he, he went up. <laughs> it's, good that, it's good that you weren't around the other disciples. And that's okay. Right? You say, why do you think that? Watch what these guys do, James and John. You say, why do you lump them in? Oh, just, just watch. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. <laughs> <laughs> Having kids will help you. These people walked up to the Lord and said, Hey, Lord, can you give us whatever we want? No. No, what's wrong with you? Verse, 30, uh, verse 36, he said unto them, What should ye that I should do for you? That's like a parent. Lord, can I have whatever I want? Mm, what is it? Verse 37. They said unto him, this is my third point, grant unto us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand in thy glory. Well, huh? another gospel tells you it was his, their mother putting him up to it. But this guy, Mark, said, yeah, but they were their own men. They knew enough to not say it if it wasn't good to say. <laughs> These fellows walked up to the Lord and said, Lord, yeah, I appreciate that suffering comment you were talking about earlier. Really inspirational stuff. By the way, we were wondering if when we get to glory, if I could sit on one side of you, now, now pay attention, if I could sit on your right hand, 
And my brother could sit on your left hand. You think that'll be all right? You know where they blundered? They should have waited for Peter to be, or Hebrews to be written. Because you know who sits on the left hand of Jesus Christ? God the Father. Jesus sits on the right hand. This is homeschool, so I'll help you with right and left. Jesus was, sits on the right hand of the Father, which means the Father sits on the left hand of Jesus Christ. These men, without meaning to, but ask the Lord to sit in God's place. Number three, the thing that will hinder you from following the Lord like you need to is your high opinion of yourself. Your high opinion of yourself. Well, what a, what a, my talents would be wasted on the mission field, would they? Or maybe the Lord just knows where to put you. Lord, I could do so much more if, I, if you just stopped and let him tell you what to do. Lord, I, can I sit on the left hand in the chief seat? And Jesus in his mercy doesn't say, no, that's God's seat. Look what he says to him. He says, you know not what you can ask. Can you drink the cup that I drink of? Ooh, the cup of suffering. And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. We don't have time to go into it, but that's not water. That's suffering. And, and he basically says, look, guys, remember that part about them killing me? You willing to do that stuff? Remember that suffering? You willing to do that stuff? That, that enduring hardship? You willing to do that? And they, look what they said. Verse 39. We can. They said on him, we can. We don't even know what it is. But yeah, we'll do it. Sure. No problem. We're the best. <laughs> Jesus said unto him, You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. Yep, we're pouring you a tall glass. And with the baptism that I baptize, you shall be baptized. Yeah, you're, you're going to, whether you can or not. Ready or not, here it comes. Verse 40, But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for who it is prepared. You know what that is? That's a good case of uh, better just to be quiet than open your mouth. Because what you did was you didn't get the chief seat, but you did get the suffering because you signed. <laughs> Can you pay the price? Sure, here's the bill. Well, do we get it? No, you still don't get <laughs> what you're looking for, but you, now you got a bill. You know what we think of ourselves? We think of ourselves so highly, though. Yeah. Now, now, watch this. I, I, I'm trying to be hurried. You know what we do sometimes? We'll serve the Lord. You hear, you hear a preacher say, listen, if you, if you give, if you, if you be a blessing, like we talked about in our first point, if you'll give those temporal things, God will bless you. And you know what? Sometimes your heart will get wrong. And sometimes you'll say, all right, I'll give it, God, if you'll give me something. If you'll get, Brother, we don't serve for rewards. We serve because he is worthy. What if you give it all and he doesn't give you anything in return, physically, until later? Is he worthy? Well, that's a different story, is it? I remember the story, it wasn't me, but a missionary went to a meeting. I don't even know if it's a true story, I just read it in a book. A missionary went to a, store, uh, a meeting, him and his son were there. They passed an offering plate. That man pulled out $2 to do it in an offering. The pastor said, everything that comes in tonight will go to the missionaries, a love offering. Help them get down the road and such. That man sat there and said, okay, give me the praise the Lord. Put the envelope, as we're taught to do, you don't open it and look at it for the pastor. You know, it's intact. So he put his pocket in. Oh, thank, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Got in the car, opened it up. It was $2. He was all upset. His son was sitting there and he said, Come on, $2. Drove all the way here and he's complaining. He goes, And on top of that, I gave those $2. <laughs> and the little boy looks at his dad and he says, Well, Daddy, maybe if you put more in, you would have got more. <laughs> Just a question. We're expecting God to give and give and give you. Why don't you just give it to him without expecting stuff back? Yeah. We're willing to suffer for the chief seats. Well, you're going to suffer and you don't get the chief seat. Ah. I'll give the money if they'll, I'll fill out the card if they'll call my name. I'll, I'll do it if they can, well, just do it. All right, moving on. And when the 10 heard it, <laughs> verse 41. They began to be much displeased with James and John. They weren't displeased until Jesus said no. They were standing there. Can we, can we sit on your right hand or left hand? Shh, 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 shh. Hey, man, how, how do you think that's going to go? 
uh, well, you're going to have to suffer, but you nobody gets those seats because they're not mine. Oh, oh, you bunch of bums. Why would you even ask for that? They were sitting there waiting to see if they could outdo James and John. <laughs> well, let's see. We'll see the trick. I could probably do it better than James and John. <laughs> verse 42. You, listen, by the way, you know who's part of that in verse 41? Peter. The guy who gave all to follow him. Verse 42. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. <laughs> but whosoever shall be great among you shall be your minister or servant. And whosoever of you shall be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Watch this verse. This is key. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus looks at him, stay with me, stay with me. I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. Jesus looks at him and he says, when we think of ourselves too high for the sacrifice of our saviors. Brethren, he is worthy, is he not? He is worthy. All right, let's finish this up. Jesus finishes this discourse. He's telling them about servants. He's telling them about humility. He's telling them to humble themselves. Verse 46, let's finish the sermon. And they came to Jericho as he came, and as he came out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, Blind Bartimaeus. If you've, been any, if you've been in church any time, you've heard a sermon on blind Bartimaeus. The son of Timaeus sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. Other gospels tell you it's the disciples telling him that. But he says many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now, context, ready? Context. <laughs> that rich young ruler comes up. He's rich. He's better than all the disciples. He's rich. 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 He's r
Verse 50. Or, I'm sorry, verse 49. Jesus stood still, commanded him to be called, and they called the blind men, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise. He calleth thee. Now you can read that in whatever tone of voice you want. Be of good comfort. I think it was more like, huh, you got your way. Fine. You get what you want. It's probably the same guys that told him to hush that now have to walk over there and tell him, okay, come on. And you got your way. You got your way. Come on. Fine. I don't know why. I don't know why. I mean, he's, he's one of them. If it was up to me. <laughs> Verse 50. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Doesn't that sound like a familiar question? James and John just asked, Lord, we wilt that thou was whatever, whatsoever we desire. What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The Lord's attention was given to two individuals, and one asked for preeminence, and look what the other one asked for. What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. James and John said, I want to sit above everybody. And this man says, I just want to see. We can liken that. You've heard the sermon, surely, about blind Bartimaeus. I just want, I just want salvation. I just want some help. It's a great New Testament type of a man coming to Christ in his blindness and his sin and needing to be born again and coming and not asking for anything other than just the forgiveness of sins and God giving it to him. And look what happens. Verse 52, we're going to finish. Last verse. We made it through the whole chapter. I mean, we want to weigh our time, but it's okay. Verse 52, Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. You remember that? That's where we started. That rich young ruler. Said, Go thy way. Sell what thou hast, give to the poor, and come and follow me. And that man went his way and didn't get arrested. He looks at this, this blind man and he says, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Immediately he received his sight. And look at this. The first guy in the chapter to do it is the lowest, the least esteemed, the one who has the least to offer, the one who has nothing of benefit to the Savior, is the only one who does it, who follows Jesus in the way. Last point. You know what that man got? He had an understanding of what it was his Savior did for him. You know what will hinder you? Last point. On not following the Lord like you're supposed to, you've forgotten what a great thing he did when he saved you. I know the Bible says we're to forget those things which are behind and pressing forward towards them. I understand that, but sometimes you have, you've just gotten a little too forgetful of how awful that miry pit was. How awful that, that clay was. How, how great of a work he did when he set your feet upon that rock and established Brother, we get, we get so religious in our Christianity. We think that, that this thing is just, just, well, almost like we deserve it. We're so American in our thinking that Christianity has turned into a right. Brother, we don't deserve none of this. We deserve hell. Like the old South Carolina preacher said, I deserve to be in hell with my back broke. <laughs> That's what we deserve. We deserve death and hell, and a Savior reached down and lifted us up out of that miry clay, saved us, washed us, made us the sons of God, gave us eternal life, and no man can pluck us out of his hands. And you know when you become uninterested in following him? When you forget that. Now watch this, and I'm done. That man was told a command that a few others were told. The disciples were told to follow me. They were scared. That young man was told to follow, but uh, it's too much of a sacrifice. And this young man, or I don't know, young or old, this, young, this man sitting here, Jesus said, go thy way. And he got to thinking, I think. And he looked, which way would that, which, what way am I going to go? My way has led me to a place of utter my way to this point has led me to a beggar's cup. My way so far has led me to yelling at passers by for help. I don't have a way to this place. I can just follow you. And I actually just got to learn that that's the goal that Jesus has been trying to accomplish the whole night. Let me give up. And he just kind of hit in the face and looked at the guy and said, You don't have a way to this place. Go your way. Following Jesus. 
than we could ever repay in a thousand lifetimes. And yet we ponder the smallest sacrifice. Brethren, I appreciate you, you, your patience tonight. I know I went over time, but I just want you to consider, I don't know how much of this affects you. I don't know where you're at in your life. We've been a few days together in this meeting, but really, how much can you really, really get to know someone's heart in this time? But I'll tell you what, if God is pushing you to either go or serve more or give more or do something more, I, I guarantee you one of those reasons gets in there. One of them does. And if you're not careful, we'll begin to think of ourselves more highly. We'll begin to think our sacrifice to be so great. We'll begin to fear that our Savior won't get us through this suffering. And it's all because we've forgotten what a great God he was when he saved us. Brethren, if I can encourage you in anything tonight, let those hindrances be put aside. You may have to pray. You may have to seek the Lord. You may have to seek some counsel. You may have to seek encouragement from brethren. But all of that is the attack of the adversary who wars on our mind. And our God has not given us the spirit of fear love and the power and of a sound mind. If you get any of that thinking in your mind that you're great and our sacrifice is great and the suffering isn't worth it or the salvation wasn't as impressive as you think it was, you're not thinking with a sound mind. Our God is worthy. And he's not worthy for you to list up this accomplishment. You'll never match it. Just give it all to him and don't ask no questions. Just follow. Amen? Let's pray, and then pastor or whoever come close as you see fit. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this meeting. Thank you for these folks that have come tonight on a weeknight to hear your word. And Lord, I know we went long, and I, I sure appreciate these folks and their patience. I pray you bless them. I pray this has been a help to somebody. Lord, as we're, we're constantly encouraged to follow you, but we're constantly attacked. Constantly, even our own flesh pushes us to just not do what we're supposed to do. I pray you'd help us, Lord, to get these issues straight in our life, that we might be the Christians that we're supposed to be and the servants that you'd have us be in this world. I pray that you'd bless us, bless our time remaining this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand, please, as the piano plays. I encourage you to come and do business with the Lord at the altar. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. Let's grab our hymn books and go to number 377. We'll sing the first and last verse of Rescue the Perishing, 377. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, 
Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Samrat, for that great message. Our Lord is worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? There was a time where I was uh, listening to uh, some missionary stories, and that thought was the challenge to my heart. And I remember sitting at the top of my stairs at 3910 White Oak Court in Flower Mound, Texas, and doing business with the Lord and Imagining if the Lord were to take my children. And just that thought. I wept. And then I thought. If the Lord were to take my wife. And I wept. How am I going to raise my kids without my wife? Little did I know a few years later that would happen. God's worth it worth it. Praise the Lord. I wouldn't be here had he not. I wouldn't have got to enjoy being a pastor here had he had I not been. He's worth it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Don't forget we have a meal downstairs and uh, we would like to, to enjoy uh, some fellowship with the missionaries. So uh, let's uh, bow for prayer and be dismissed. And uh, if you would, um, the one who I asked to pray, if you would pray for the food, and I ask the Lord to bless the food. Uh, Brother uh, um, Fulton, would you please uh, ask the Lord's blessing on the food and dismiss us?